Welcome, 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 welcome. One more welcome for everybody, just one, not two. Uh, thank you for joining us, part of our continuing series where we talk to people on the left, people on the right, professors, academics, reporters, activists, politicians, anybody who can think clearly and provide a unique perspective. We want to provide it to you unedited and unaltered so that you could do this thing that was popular when I was in high school called thinking for yourself. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it won't. With this today, it's our privilege to have Professor David Dunning. He's at the uh, psychology school at the University of Michigan. Uh, his research focuses on psychology underlying human misbelief. In his most widely cited work, he showed that people tend to hold flattering opinions of their competence, character, and prospects that cannot be justified from objective evidence, a phenomenon that carries many implications for health, education, the workplace, and economic exchange. He also examines how many of these same processes also injure judgments made by groups. Dunning's other research focuses on decision making in various settings in work on economic games. He explores how choices commonly presumed to be economic in nature actually hinge more on psychological factors such as social norms and emotion. In particular, he documents that people trust complete strangers in situations in which the economic analysis would suggest no trust whatsoever. Finally, Dunning explores how people's preferences and wishes distort their own judgments and conclusions. In past work, he has shown how the influence of motivated reasoning extends even down to the shape, down to shape per perceptual experience, such as vision and hearing. Uh, he's been at the University of Michigan, also at Cornell University, and he was also t taught a little bit at Yale University and the Sonder Folkschung Bereich University and Institutes for Wirtschaft. Uh, he was also at Stanford University, so a lot of great universities, and he's taught a lot of different places. Uh, some of the grants that he's worked on, investigating motivated reasoning and intellectual humility, epistemic trespassing and public discourse, cognitive habits of intellectual humility, the gist of hot and cold cognition and adolescent risk-taking, motivated reasoning, identity, identifying experience and ignorance in self and others, accuracy and error, self-judgment, self-esteem, and social judgment. Um judgment biases and perception, self-cognition, where does intellectual humility reside, the trouble of not knowing what you do not know, and an introduction to reason, bias, and inquiry. And this was the series where I found the professor, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's check in first. Uh, professor, did I say anything wrong? Do we need to correct anything about your bio at all? Uh, not that I know of. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. We love that here. Um, well, let's get into it then. What there was this series on political polarization. Uh, it had a variety of speakers. The U.S. is experiencing unprecedented levels of political polarization relative to the past decades, especially in terms of effective polarization, something we've talked about a lot here at the series, or feelings of dislike and distrust toward members of the opposing party. In this Winter Talk series, we will hear from experts across disciplines in order to better understand why political polarization is so high and what, if anything, we can do about it. Uh, and here's a little bit close up on that series, the University of Michigan. Why was this series done? Why did you participate in it? Why did people think it was a good idea? I'll ask you about what you said is maybe the reasonings for political polarization and the um, solutions. But first, I want to get into why was this series? Why were people coming together? Why did you think this was a good idea? And before you answer, if you could answer as an American with two working eyeballs, not just an academic, and explain it to me as if I've been in a cave oh, for okay. seven years. Uh, What's going on? Why did they have a class at a university? Why was this worth having multiple professors come out? Well, if you've been in the cave for the, the past seven years, well, for, for much longer than the past seven years, the uh, Research Center for Group Dynamics uh, at uh, the University of Michigan has ha been having seminars on the issues of the day. And uh, this was a series that was put together by my colleague, Amy Gordon, uh, because it's clear for the past 20 years, or you could say for the past 50 years, the nature of political disagreement in the United States has been changing from disagreement over um, issues, policy, to disagreement over each other. And it's taken a, an emotional cast. Um, for example, very, very few parents would have been minded if their children uh, would have married someone from the opposite political party, let's say the 1960s, but now a third 
of, let's say, Democrats and a third of Republicans would mind it very much if their children married uh, someone from uh, the opposite political party now. Uh, and uh, I'm actually not sure in 2023 if that, that percentage has risen. Uh, we've become uh, 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 it, it, we oppose each other as oppose uh, each other on issues and um, there is emotion we attach to it and sometimes the emotion can be quite negative the emotion can be quite strong uh, that's the effect of polarization uh, that's often mentioned you've just mentioned it uh, that's why uh, this series is brought together to talk about it because the University of Michigan is one of the centers in the world in talking about social trends, social phenomena, and what do we think and what do we do? So that's why it was brought together. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know it's a little bit silly of a question, but it, it helps with the series because what I'm trying to do is capture what you're seeing, not what I think is going on. But so I always ask people like, if you were explaining to somebody who didn't know, how would you characterize it? You know, because occasionally we'll get a professor two out of the last hundred who will say, oh, there's not a big problem. Everything's fine. It's a little bit overblown. So I like talking to people go, no, there's a real issue here going on. Some people are quite upset. Effective polarization. Um, that's just dislike of the other side because they're the other. That's my simplification of it. One of the debates that I've seen in this space is <clears throat> the people aren't polarized. It's just the elites. It's just the elites are polarized. The, the people actually agree with each other on they want safe places for schools and they want background checks on guns and they want women to have rights to abortion. So really, there's no polarization amongst the people. It's just amongst the elites. Is that true in your opinion? Uh, well, you could make that case, actually, uh, that uh, if you take a look at uh, where clearly the most debate happens, it is among the elites. But uh, if that's the case, the elites used to disagree with each other, mostly on policy, and now the elites have divided themselves into ideological sides. Uh, but actually, if you take a look at data, what you're finding uh, is among the non-elite. It used to be the case that people's attitudes, a lot of different policies, basically were just sort of random or mishmash were a mess. Uh, people agreed, but they certain they weren't ideological. But that's beginning to shift. Uh, people's beliefs are beginning to become more uniform. Uh, there's always been a small cadre of the elites where uh, people were more purely conservative or more purely liberal, but that's becoming more of the case all the way up and down the educational or the elite or non-elite ladder, for example. And if it's the case that uh, people might agree on what they want, um, if you ask them about individual policies, uh, the way they vote uh, seems to be much more polarized, if you will. Um, there isn't that much shifting from uh, election to election in the way that people are voting. Uh, they're voting much more consistently Republican or uh, democratic. And um, now there are some political scientists who will, uh, 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 will say things are different. Um, but from the data I've seen and, and what I've read, it does seem that there are people are, uh, voters are much more consistent in terms of, quote unquote, which side which, uh, on the partisan divide they vote for than was the case in the past. I appreciate that. It's a long running debate. It's one that I've struggled with here. I think you had um, <clears throat> professors Abramowitz versus professors Fiorina and others who were having this long running debate of, it's just the elites who are polarized. It's not the public, the public loves each other. Uh, they basically all agree on abortion policy, but for some reason we can't make it happen. It's just the elites. Well, well the answer is it's all true. It's the way you look at it, but the question is, okay, which way do you look at it counts? I think it's, the, it's, the, it's ultimately the, what you have to do. And um, uh, I, I try to look at it in the way of, okay, which way represents how elections come out? And right. uh, that's, that's my way of looking at it. But uh, often what you find is each side is right if you look at it this way or if you cut the data that way. That's um, good with that, yeah. Yeah, but I'm taking a look at, you know, uh, we don't have 
uh, Ronald Reagan landslides anymore. Uh, we yeah. don't have uh, Lyndon Johnson landslides anymore. Uh, we have 5248 elections. Thank and, um, the, and things don't shift all that much. Things are different now. And uh, so that to me is uh, the thing that defines our era. Why are people so solidly in the voting pattern that they're in? That's, that's my take. That's, I mean, that's the thing for me is like, I hear, oh, the, the people aren't polarized. It's just the elites. We don't need to bag on the, or, or insult the people. It's the elites, uh, the politicians, the media, social media companies make them this way. And then I hear statistics like, yeah, but they don't want to marry each other. Yeah. That sounds like the and people. That's different. Right. I like that's, I understand it's not an issue stance, but that does sound polarized. And like you said, If the people want all the same thing, why do they keep voting for polarized policy year after year after year after year? And we constantly hear, well, the people have a commonality on abortion and guns and everything. Okay, but they haven't voted that way in two decades. So what's the point? And, and remember, the debate is also to what extent are people giving weight to their feelings about uh, their um, political party versus the other side versus they're giving weight to policy? Right. And uh, I'm not going to speak on that because I haven't looked at, okay, what's the 2023 data in terms of how much are people voting on policy versus sure. uh, the other side. But uh, you can have people agree on policy and still think the other side is a moral danger to the United States. And there's a, there is a plurality of both parties that think that of the other side, according to uh, Pew Research Center. Uh, all that can be true. Now the question is, um, which um, uh, endorsement by voters is carrying their vote, or do neither count? It's just that people have a behavioral inertia to vote for the party that they voted for in the last three elections. I mean, those are the data I don't know, but those are the data that count, and I'd love to, uh, I'd love to find out what the latest analysis is. I think this is an excellent, excellent, excellent point. You can still have people agree on policy and still hate each other and think the other side's a bad guy. I mean, that just seems crazy uh, to me. Like, we both agree that an apple is the best fruit, not an orange, but I still hate you. Even though we, I mean, you would think because we like the typically in psychology, right? If I like the same thing that you do, you feel a commonality to me. Or, or some sort of friendship, not necessarily feelings of enemy. And uh, it doesn't seem to matter here. Uh, same Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm a social psychologist and the fact that Sorry. people can, can hold uh, beliefs that at some level seem contradictory is not a surprise. Um, okay, this uh, is common with humans. Well, th this is what being human is, where we, <laughs> we contain multitudes. Um, we are we are filled, we are filled with contradictions. Uh, I mean, and here is the biggest contradiction: uh, uh, humans are very concerned about being consistent and coherent. We are very concerned about that. That's what cognitive dissonance is. Number one. Number two. We're filled with contradictions. These two things actually coexist within us. Is one of the greatest conversations we have in in uh, social psychology. How can we be filled with contradictions? And yet, it is absolutely the case. Uh, human beings are very much worried about being coherent. It's fascinating. Worried about being coherent, inherently full of contradictions beyond what maybe we're even consciously aware of. Oh, absolutely. As soon as you make it coherent, people do, or make it conscious, people do try to explain it away. Uh, but uh, people are uh, incredibly adept at not being aware of their of their <laughs> contradictions in the world or contradictions in themselves. I don't know. All my English uh, Shakespeare classes in high school are coming back to me. And this just screams the human character condition, the what the contradictions in the human character, right? We want to be understood, and yet we don't have coherent opinions ourselves. We're not totally aware of it, but we're always trying to be understood. And we think we probably do have completely coherent um, ideologies, but we don't when you get into it. That's, like you said, the human condition. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the answer is, uh, yes, Shakespeare was an excellent theorist. <laughs> um, let me ask you about this. Uh, 
used to be people's opinions on policies were all across the board. Now their be beliefs are becoming more uniform across issues. Now, I'm not I'm not asking you to say like as a basis of fact, but as somebody who's worked in academics and as an American with two working eyeballs and working synapses, when did you notice that start to shift? Kind uh, of a personal story. Would you have like, well, that's uh, different. Uh, I would have to, for me, I, I think it would be about six months ago when I started looking at some political science papers uh, that have been looking at this. That is um, the, um, the classic uh, series of uh, papers or the classic book for me in political science, which is not my specialty, but that I refer to quite a bit, I think about quite a bit, is work by Phil Converse, uh, published in the 1960s, right. called uh, uh, Public Opinion in Mass Publics, or I, I forget, yeah. uh, but, it's, uh, but it has to do with how uh, incoherent people's uh, attitudes and opinions tend to be, that if you come and you interview a person um, in 1959 and come back and interview them in 1961, it's as though for the average person, they're picking their attitudes about the policy of the day out of thin air. It's just completely random, except for, as you mentioned before, the elites, and it's a small portion of the elites who are completely consistent. And as you go down the education ladder, things become less coherent. That for most people, uh, things aren't really well thought out. Uh, uh, that was Phil Converse's world. Uh, and that, that, that absolutely, uh, is so so it resonates with what some of your um, guests must be saying. Um, now, in data starting, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or so, uh, that is still evident if you take a look at high versus lower education. But as time has gone on, everybody is becoming more coherent uh, in terms of their uh, beliefs beginning to cohere together, uh, becoming more consistent. That is, in Phil Converse's day, there wasn't much of something called issue or ideological constraint. What I believed about uh, government funding of education didn't um, uh, correlate with whether I thought there should be a Department of Education. Right. It should, but it didn't. Now things are beginning to cohere and uh, much more. In fact, we need to go here, go here so that if I think of myself as a, a liberal or a conservative, it actually is being to influence whether or not I consider myself as white or black, religious right. or not religious. So it's, it's being right. I read that. I read that, that the political differences now, according to some, mm -hmm. not everyone agrees, but there's yeah. not just one. There's a couple people who've done this and they're saying going, Political differences are worse than race differences today. I mean, oh, I guess yeah. that's progress. Well, uh, when uh, political differences are, uh, are, are predict whether or not you um, uh, take uh, uh, COVID vaccines, right? Uh, that's like a, a number one uh, predictor. That's an amazing state of the world. But uh, b but now attitudes are beginning to cohere around that centroid, if you will. And that's different. And that's been developing, I think, for the past 20 years. So no, don't quote me on that. I'm going to have to review that because I'm going to be lecturing on that. <laughs> next week in my class. I am going to be lecturing on that uh, because we're talking about cognitive distance and coherence belief. But um, uh, so... Uh, I've just been monitoring this because in psychology there is work about about how much our beliefs and our attitudes cohere. And if you can persuade a person on belief X, can you influence their belief Y, which is related? Right. And uh, sometimes you can, but there is also a lot of just randomness in the head. Um, uh, but there seems to be less randomness in the head going on politically with people up and down the elite scale. And uh, that's different from Phil Converse's day. And uh, that's fascinating. When did that, when do you think that started? I think that it started, I think that started in the 90s. Um, okay. And I, I think that come, and I think it's uh, uh, my take, and this is not scientific, this is just speculation on my part. That starts with the internet and now we're being just uh, inundated with information. 
and uh, that's we're being it, it, uh, um, inundated with information regardless of uh, education level now. Uh, you don't have to uh, pick up a book. You don't have to take a class. Uh, you're just online now. And people are making, it's easier for outside agents to communicate to you. And uh, they're making sure that they do so. Uh, professor, uh, many newspapers and politicians have said political polarization never existed before we had social media. It's these social media apps that made us polarized and things were, you know, they alone caused the problem. And if we could just get rid of Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, we go back to a past without political polarization. Does that make sense to you? I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I'm agnostic on that. Um, it, because it, I think uh, mid 20th century, uh, both parties, were centrist parties, but pre uh, the depression, I wouldn't be surprised if we were polarized then as well. Interesting. Uh, you, uh, you should ask a historian uh, because the politics of the 20th century were pretty, uh, uh, from the New Deal on, were pretty strange. Uh, if you think about uh, the New Deal coalition, it was. Um, the south and northeastern uh urban liberals put together and that wasn't the coalitions that were in play before um the depression so there may have been a polarization beforehand but i'm not a historian so i don't know that's the question that i've always had fair but, enough fair enough so yeah. we may I've, I've heard that from a few professors that they said uh the period from 1945 to 1985 was bizarre and unique. It was a period of great commonality and everyone coming together mostly. And it was unique in American history because you had the Civil War, you had uh, mm -hmm. the period after 1870s, you had the 1920s, you had the 1930s, you had all these other periods of ups and downs. So maybe it's not so bizarre looking at grand American history, it's just bizarre to us now because we've had such an abnormally long period of everyone roughly getting along that we kind of tricked ourselves into thinking this is the way it's always supposed to be when that was never the truth. Um, there was periods of high polarization, periods of less polarization, periods of high. And so we're just going back into that. But we wouldn't know it because we're looking at an arc of 200 years, uh, you know, and our human experience only goes the last couple of decades. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised, and uh, I don't know. It's just that uh, during 45 to 85 was, was certainly us versus the Soviet Union, and there's something to bring people together than some third party. You know, uh, right. if you have a common enemy that brings people together, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be surprised. That was an unusual uh, period of history. A great uh, existential threat. Uh, okay, so lots of people come together. I did find this interesting. Um, elite polarization differences maybe started in the 1990s. A lot of people are saying that. Um, mm -hmm. They're saying that that roughly looks like when things started. Not everybody, but a lot of people. So I found that interesting. And that was my answer is if polarization started in the 1990s, but social media didn't become a real force in politics till around 2014, 2015, then what was called causing polarization before well we did have the internet and the first highly polarizing event of the 1990s was the monica Lewinsky trial or mm. affair. and that got started because of a blog site called the drudge report mm. cnn abc nbc cbs didn't really want to cover the monica Lewinsky scandal and weren't really doing that then the drudge report kept talking about it generated so much traffic it forced all the major networks to cover it and then they were doing it so we never were going to have that if we didn't have the drudge report the drudge report was definitely a beast from the internet and it exi existed 10 to 15 years before social media so that's i i agree with you that's where i'm going it starts somewhere in the 1990s and the internet if not the cause was uh, a big part well, it was I, yeah. I think the internet is an accelerant, and I, I think it's because it uh, it doesn't create more voices. But if you have a voice, it's, uh, it allows voices to get to more people more quickly. Um, 
uh, a bigger reach, if you will, or makes the voice louder. I think that that's certainly what happens. I mean, I opened my email. Oh, the number of people asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let me ask you what the series asked. Um, why is political polarization so high, and what can we do about it? Uh, it's a, a interesting question. Uh, mostly it had to, do, like you said, a lot of it had to do with whether or not um, there really is political polarization. So there uh, was some uh, talk about is uh, there really selectivity in terms of who's watching Fox versus MSNBC, for example. And it depends on how you cut it up. Um, uh, but there, uh, there are millions of liberals who watch Fox. And there are millions of conservatives who do watch MSNBC. That that certainly is true. Uh, that's uh, one way you can take a look at it. If you take a look at who lives in what neighborhood, uh, uh, we uh, many more people are living in landslide neighborhoods. That is uh, a greater uh, people's neighborhoods tend to be more uniform in terms of who they vote for, either in a liberal neighborhood or conservative neighborhood, where neighborhoods tend to be 50-50s, your neighbors tend to be more, uh, you know, uh, members of the opposition party, and now they tend to be more of a, 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 a liberal party. Uh, I certainly live in a landslide city. I live in Ann Arbor. Uh, I probably live in a landslide building, but I really don't know. Why did you say city? Do you live in a landslide state? Uh, no, I live in a, definitely I live in a swing state. I live in Michigan and Michigan is 5248. Um, uh, in the, oh, I, I don't even think it's that, excuse me. I think it's uh, 5048 in the last election. So, so but, like go ahead. Right. Well, I, I, I think I'm, I, I was coyly trying to hint at, I think you're saying you live in a liberal city surrounded by conservative rural areas. Mm. Am I wildly off? Oh, no. Um, uh, it's certainly the case that in Michigan, uh, there are a number of liberal cities surrounded by rural areas. Um, during the pandemic, um, <clears throat> if you were in many cities, you could tell just by mask wearing uh, how things would change as soon as you crossed the city limit, uh, going out or going in, for example. Uh, which gas station you stopped at, for example. So, uh, really? oh, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's so I obvious. Know. It's not remarkable. Yeah, but I love these personal stories because I'm here in California. And again, my opinion doesn't matter. It's, it's trying to get it from around the places. So you're in Michigan and you're saying during COVID, you could see big differences of the people, not the elites, right? I'm imagining Mitch McConnell and AOC aren't hanging out there. These are regular Michiganders right. and they are broken up into hell. No, you're not putting a mask on me, Fauci, or, Oh my God, we all have to come together or we could die. And you literally saw that gas station to gas station. Is oh yeah, true? absolutely. Well, I remember, but, but it's true everywhere. I remember once I was being driven around Columbus, Ohio, and it's a wonderful, pleasant, great city. But as I'm being driven around, people are kind of going, oh, that's the Republican neighborhood. That's a Democratic neighborhood. This is a Republican neighborhood. <laughs> and I thought this is wild. Um, uh, uh, that's, that, that, I think, is a city that's much more 50-50. But even then, it's sort of balkanized by neighborhood, which I thought was interesting. Uh, but th that is a product of our time. Um, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll leave it for people to, to reflect on it and it's not a scientific insight but um i know, I know. It's but it certainly uh is um uh it, it but it, it certainly is notable even my uh hometown which used to be republican is itself now democratic but it's surrounded by republican county which i think is interesting was uh, it like that before covid uh, it was like that up until, uh, it was Republican until, uh, I think the mid 20 teens and then it flipped democratic. When did you notice things getting this polarized? Was it during COVID was the first time or oh, it, oh, in general in the, um, 
uh, the, the concept or the phenomenon of the landslide county or the landslide district has been uh, talked about for the past 20 years. Right, right, right. But I'm just saying in, in, in Michigan, when you notice this level of polarization during COVID, did you notice that same level of polarization, that same level of polarization before COVID? Like, did it happen? A lot of people say the moment Trump was elected, I noticed something. Some people say I didn't notice anything for a couple of years. Uh, I uh, I don't th uh, I don't think so. I think mask wearing though is sort of at the individual level. You can just notice something. Okay. And okay. Uh, uh, that is and during the early days of COVID, where just sort of people, it was like a badge that people could wear or not. Okay. Are you going to wear a mask or not? And that made it fairly um, obvious. But it was quite uh, it was. Uh, 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 it was quite uh, just quite noticeable, and uh, you know, I'm I'm a psychologist. I'm just interested in what's going on, and so it just became noticeable uh, as soon as it started happening. So, is uh, the reason we have polarization is the internet? Um, well, everything is due to uh, a number of factors that have to come together. Okay. So the internet might be the accelerant. Uh, I think there can be uh, elite messaging that uh, uh, is also an accelerant. There can be uh, a psychology of what people want to hear uh, based on preferences or uh, a desire uh, once your group shows a preference that you adopt because you want to be a, a member of your group. Um, there are a number of factors that, that simply come together. And uh, so uh, 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 polarization, and then they begin to snowball as uh, people stop focusing on policy and start focusing on the other group, especially when elite messaging starts to focus on the other group as the problem, as opposed to a policy issue being the problem. I want to ask you about the psychology of what people want to hear, but I, I first want to ask you, um, I just, I just got to ask, did we exist in a perfect state of nature and there were no problems? And then Donald Trump came, and he alone caused polarization in America. Oh, uh, 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 I, I the boogeyman theory. We uh, were pretty cool, and then he came, and he smashed it all by himself. Uh, I'm going to say no, uh, because um, uh, there is there is no cause, or if he's a cause, every cause is a symptom of something else. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, if if it hadn't been him, there would have been some other development that was caused by other stuff that was happening before. Perfect so. answer. I'll get you that money after the show. Oh, great. Well, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. We have no coordinate. I, I'm I, I'm tongue in cheek about it, and I apologize. But I live out here in California, and we mm -hmm. literally had lawyers, professors, politicians, everybody, at all, top level, smartest people, the dumbest people, going. Oh yeah, uh, Trump. You know that all him racism, xenophobia, sexism started with him. You know we we these problems went away in the '90s, and then it was all perfect, and then Trump came and he made it all bad by himself. And I was like, that's exactly like that acts like there was no political problems before there was no racial dog whistling in the Republican Party before there was no xenophobia against the immigrants in the Republican Party before I know that's not true I'm I'm half Mexican I know that's not true well so, yeah I mean th there's the 90s in California right right uh, uh, good, good times yeah and then and uh, we can go back to Nixon but you know I'm I'm not a political historian uh I want to ask you about the psychology of what people want to hear. What does that mean? Well, uh, it is the case that uh, we do try to be honest, but unfortunately, um, our thinking is contaminated by uh, what we want to be true. 
um, uh, the one one phrase that has uh, come out of psychology and permeated, uh, infused other academic fields, and infused into popular culture. Um, and I'm happy it's done so. In fact, I, I worry that it's done so too much is the idea of motivated reasoning, that people are motivated to engage in wishful thinking, rationalization, self-deception, um, of rose-colored glasses, um, it there is a tremendous catalog of strategies and moves we do uh, that we engage uh, so that we can self-deceive and um, believe things that we want to be true. Or let's put it this way. The things that we want to be true, uh, we give privileged status so that we can believe them to be true. Right. And the things we don't want to uh, believe is true, well, we give them a hard time so that uh, we can disbelieve them. And uh, you mentioned it in your intro. I mean, we've, uh, we've done work that, that extends down even to the realm of vision. I mean, literally, you see what I saw you that. Um, and uh, you don't see what you don't want to see. Um, That's insane. Well, That's crazy we do that. Well, but uh, once you start doing the work, you begin to realize, oh, uh, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> um, this, is, this is what it means to be human. This is what it means to be human. This is what it means to have eyes. Uh, so uh, you're biased. You're biased, folks, as much as you think you're not biased. As well, much as yeah. you think you're not biased, you're biased. Well, it, yes, you are biased, and you're biased in a way that you won't know that you're biased. Uh, I mean, the, the the one thing to say is, uh, and this is about uh, your senses and your vision, is you don't see the world, uh, physical world, the way it really is. But that's okay because if you did, you would you would be dead. Uh, no, I'm serious. It, it, your brain is an artist; it's painting a depiction of the world. But that's okay because if it did, you would be dead. Um, it's too hard uh, to take the reality. Well, no, it's uh, uh, here's one example. Uh, it takes your brain, let's say, a tenth of a second to sort of compose the picture at sea. <clears throat> you are living in the past. And if I threw a baseball at your head, you would never catch it because the baseball you would see if it were the brain were telling you what it was really seeing. That's the baseball a tenth of a second ago. You would miss it. So it projects the baseball ahead. So everything you see moving, your brain is projected a tenth of a second ahead. So your brain is doing this sort of stuff all the time. And it's the basis for a lot of visual illusions are really what your, your brain is doing in an evolutionarily favorable way. But your brain will play um, tricks on you. And... Uh, so, and some of them have to do with your wishes. So one experiment we did is uh, we um, showed people on a table some chocolates, wonderful, sweet smelling chocolates, something they were in a paper bag and, or excuse me, a plastic bag. And we asked them to stand a certain uh, 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 ways away from them. And the way they stood indicated that they thought the chocolates were actually closer than they were. Well, your brain loved these chocolates, so they thought they were close. Or we took the chocolates and fashioned them like they were dog poop <laughs> and uh, asked them to stand the, the same distance away. And people stood in such a way that indicated they thought the poop was actually farther away from them because these are this, you don't want to be close to this thing. Now, the paradox is this really meant they were standing closer to the dog poop because they thought the dog poop was further away. That's what their brain decided. Um, but, uh, but your brain is making these decisions based on desire, what it's seeing um, uh, all the time. It's constructing uh, a, a, a depiction of the world. It's making choices based on ambiguous stimuli or data that it's getting from the world all the time and it is influenced by your desires well so are our thoughts so is our reasoning sure sure uh, it, and this is happening all the time. so is our political uh beliefs uh that's happening all the time as well i i guess what i'm curious about is that uh going back to the is it the elites or the people i've heard a lot of people say well it's the elites that cause polarization 
take a look at Donald Trump. He said all these dog whistling racist things. And then that sent cues and we started seeing more people engaged in racism. But I've also heard a contrary theory. Donald Trump was a Democrat historically. He was hanging out with Hillary Clinton historically. So how do you get from this guy to that guy? Well, there's a period called the Tea Party during presidency of Barack Obama. And they were talking about things like Obama's not a real American. He can't be a real American for various mm -hmm. racist reasons, largely. Uh, and they held an event on Martin Luther King's birthday in Washington, D.C., where they kind of dog whistled racism again. Well, Donald Trump was hanging out with them, watching their tweets, gradually repeating it. He didn't start with the birther conspiracy. He watched them tweet it, and then he'd occasionally tweet out at it, saw the reaction, and then dug down into it. Mm -hmm. What that tells me is maybe he spit back racism is, is tolerable to the mass public, but he didn't get the idea. He got the idea from the public, which means the public gives cues to the elites, and maybe the cues give it back to the public. Well, we, yeah. Is well, that possible when we look at um, the psychology of what people want to hear? People wanted to hear someone talking about racism is okay. Well, so I think, figure that out. Yeah, I think it, it is the case that uh, people do uh, give the public what they want. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised about that. Uh, wouldn't be surprised about that uh, at all, that uh, politicians can shape what the public thinks, uh, but the public can certainly shape what politicians say, uh, absolutely. Uh, that They can reward uh, politicians who say popular things. Um, that is, if we watch uh, politicians, we typically see they tend to trend toward agreeing with the public more, more than the right. public trends toward the green politicians more both happen but um uh uh certainly politicians can uh trend toward um uh where the fav where public favor lies so uh, that's uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all we're uh <clears throat> we're winding down unfortunately uh, you've been fascinating I want to get to my last two. Oh, no, I, I love it. I love it, especially when you said there are things coming out of the field of psychology that have been adopted by other disciplines and you have some difference in how they're being interpreted. That's great because that's barely talked about um, psychology, sociology, political psychology, political science are all looking at similar things. But in a little bit of research I've done, they're coming at it with a variety of different assumptions and background. And oh, background absolutely. Research. And so they're kind of occasionally overlapping occasionally not overlapping um there seems to be a big difference between i don't know sociology psychology and political science on the role of the elites in the public and how it overplays like a lot of political scientists are no it's only the elites period yeah um and that's you get a different nuance with psychologists well psychologists the the, the sin of psychology is it tends to ignore the elites altogether um <laughs> and uh, I, I if any psychologists are watching this they're probably going what do you mean and, and and other psychologists are going. Who are these elites? But um, uh, but it's uh, 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 but it's uh, but the the elites do play a role, and I think psychologists are only being to recognize uh, the important role that that the elite environment plays in terms of of uh, the psychology of of. Of the common individual or the, or the lay person. I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate you saying that. Um, okay, last two questions. This is my favorite one. You're not you. You're not me. You're a third party person watching this video. You watch the video, you go, wow, I learned a lot about psychology, other academic disciplines, how they're looking at this, how the human mind works, how it relates. But I'm struggling to remember it all. But there was this one thing the professor said, and it's five days later after I watched the video. And while I struggle to remember everything in the video, there's this one thought I just can't stop thinking about that this professor said. What is that one thought you would want someone to not be able to stop thinking about five days after they watched this video? Oh, it's something I haven't said yet. <laughs> which is, uh, it's not, uh, in terms of motivated reasoning or in terms of polarization, it's not about how educated or how intelligent you are to be captured by this bug. 
it's about how emotionally you're caught up in your ideology or your partisanship. Um, being caught up is not about being uneducated or not being cognitively able. It's often portrayed that way, but it's not. Um, it's helpful to be educated. It's helpful to be intelligent. But what really drives partisanship, at least in the data from our lab and other labs, is how emotionally invested, how emotionally caught up you are in uh, partisanship, uh, uh, your party, uh, or your ideology. That's the thing that matters. That's the thing you have to watch out for. So intelligence is not going to save you. It's taking a deep breath is going to save you. That That's the thing that I would want people to remember. So that's the thing I, I finally said. That's That's brilliant. I've heard that from a few other people, not that many. Just because you're educated and smart doesn't mean that you can't be biased either. And a lot of us are biased and even the more I've heard something that said, the more educated you get, the more likely you are to think that you can't be biased, which is even worse. Yeah. Because you can't. Yeah. And there, there are some people who will say because you're intelligent, you will be more biased. I, 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 that's not my reading of, of, of the data that I see uh, in the grand wash of, of social science. But it, it truly is the case that intelligence won't save you at all from a bias. Right. You really have to take a deep breath and ask, uh, am I being um, impartial here? You really do. I'm smart, I'm educated, therefore I must be right, isn't good enough. You mm -hmm. can be emotionally caught mm -hmm. up. That's right. And it could be biasing your worldview. That's right. Uh, uh, any recommendations? You don't have to, but we always try to keep mm -hmm. the conversation going. Do you know anybody? They could be an academic, they could be an activist, it could be someone you meet at the bar who can talk intelligently about this topic have an honest conversation. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I would just recommend the British press. <laughs> Done. Uh, yeah, I'd recommend the BBC. I'd recommend the Guardian. I'd get out of the, United, the head of the United States. I mostly get my American news from foreign sources. Yeah, already. believe me. Yeah, that's that's the way to do it. Um, yeah, I already I, I do that. Yeah, the CBC, uh, you get out of the States. Yeah, I do a lot of um, French, um, India, Japanese, um, and British news. They seem to, they have their own agendas, but it seems to be less overt when they're talking about America because it's not their own country. So yeah. they can be a little bit more free because they're, you know, it's not their people per se. Yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, we'll leave it there. I want to say thank you for coming out, Professor. I really appreciate your time. I will email you a copy of the video shortly, and I want to say thank you for coming out, and I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. All right. I'll email you shortly, and thank you again, sir. Take care.